Hello, everyone. This is Matt Britton, founder and CEO of Suzy, and I am excited to be back for yet another edition of our State of the Consumer webinar series. Uh, we had hoped to be in person for this series by now, but uh, that is not yet the case, but we're getting closer, I feel like. I have high hopes for 2022. Uh, I had high hopes for 2021. 2021 has been a little bit of an up and down year in terms of our ability to get back to normal. Uh, but we're all hopeful that as we head into 2022, we can start to finally come out of this pandemic. And let's uh, be hopeful that we can all stay healthy and keep our sanity through all of this. Uh, I'm here in Brooklyn, New York. The leaves are falling. I woke up this morning and it was a brisk 50 degrees out. We are definitely in the heart of fall, uh, slowly creeping towards winter here in New York City. I know we have people joining us um, from all around the country, so I hope many of you are still somewhere nice and sunny like California or Florida. But the season's changing here is nice. And the season's changing, especially as we get into fall, to me means football and it means Halloween. Um, and Halloween is coming very quickly. Um, it's, it's a holiday that uh, many kids really look forward to. It's really the highlight of their year. And obviously, it's very important to a lot of businesses, especially those in the food and beverage space, those who sell costumes, um, those who sell uh, beer and, and wine spirits. It's, it's a big time of year for them as well. So we think it's a great idea every year to dive deep, um, have a little fun with it, and dive deep into Halloween. And this year, we're calling the Halloween Rebound because Halloween 2021 uh, sure looks a lot different than Halloween 2020. Uh, which again is something that uh, is a good thing. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Suzy. I've been running these uh, state of consumer webinars since March of 2020. Um, we still have some loyalists. I, as I look through the names, people who've been really with us since the beginning of, of the state of the consumer series, we get great feedback from our partners, from our customers, from the market research and branding and advertising industry as a whole. And I know that as um, things start to open, you have many other uh, places to spend your time. And I'm very thankful that you're spending your time here with me today. Um, and we will be sending a copy of this uh, webinar, digital version, to everybody who's joined. So feel free to share it with your colleagues, et cetera. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Suzy is, we are a real-time market research platform. Uh, we're used by now over 350 companies uh, to really help them conduct on-demand market research uh, with a software platform that combines the uh, highest quality market research tools with the highest quality consumer audience to deliver trusted insights in minutes. Um, so if you have any more requests or want to know more about Suzy or see a demo, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be sure to set that up for you. Um, today, we will be going through a study that was uh, conducted using the Suzy platform from September 29th and 30th with a sample size of 1,000 Americans, the sample size directory representative of U.S. consumers, um, and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So let's jump in. Um, 2020 was not very fun as it relates to Halloween, as I just mentioned. 53% uh, of the respondents we spoke to didn't participate in any Halloween-related activities at all. They kind of just shut down for Halloween. It kind of reminds me when I was a kid, you'd knock on all these doors and you'd see all these welcoming parents and then there'd be that one door where nobody was home. Um, nobody was home for a lot of uh, a lot of neighborhoods for Halloween uh, in 2020. And uh, it was kind of a bummer for kids because, you know, it's a rite of passage and, and, and it's memories that many kids just would, you know, never will get back in 2020. And um, again, this year, things are certainly looking brighter, at least um, from the feedback we've gotten as a result of this study. Um, you know, we had Halloween bans. L.A. Can County actually banned Halloween at one point and then came back and said trick or treating is not recommended. So you had actually municipalities getting involved and saying, listen, it's a public safety concern. We want to cancel Halloween. Um, obviously, that wasn't the case with every state around the country, as we've continued to see through the polarization of the COVID pandemic um, on both sides of, of the aisle. Uh, but for many kids, you know, they, they were you know, left out, um, you know, of the Hall Halloween holiday for last year. And adults didn't really have too much fun at all. Um, you know, they, it was something that they weren't really comfortable with uh, in many areas. And again, with everything that was happening last year, it wasn't a Halloween to remember. But in 2021, everyone from brands to kids, to parents, to teachers, they're trying to bring back the Halloween, Halloween spirit back from the dead. Um, you're seeing way more promotional activity going on across consumer packaged goods companies. Um, I think that they know that this is a huge driver of volume every single year. Uh, it is a rite of passage. It is a tradition 
for American consumers, and they're certainly supporting it. Universal Studios is doing Halloween Horror Nights. You're seeing a lot of the entertainment companies really step it up and really try to bring this ho uh, holiday back um, and make sure that you know it can become the community building, memory building activity that it once was. Um, so we're going to really dive into three areas during today's uh, presentation. And then we're going to bring on some very special guests um, from the Food Dive magazine, Candy Industry magazine, and Mondelez, real experts on the candy industry and real experts on Halloween, um, and really get their insights into what they're seeing from their businesses. But first, we're going to go over some research, which will ultimately become the basis uh, for that discussion. So the three uh, territories we're going to cover is first and foremost, how do Americans feel? Second, what are they planning to do? And third, how will they spend their money? So we're going to dive into it. Um, as always, uh, my trusted partner, Abel Flint, um, is on the message boards. If you have any questions or um, points that you'd like us to cover during this webinar, uh, obviously feel free to reach out. So welcome to a spooky Susie state of the consumer. 29% of respondents agree with the statement, Halloween 2020 will be an all-out celebration. Uh, making up for last year. So consumers are looking to make up for what they missed last year. Nearly half of consumers are finally feeling excited about Halloween. Um, and people are most excited about spending time with family, the costumes, um, trick-or-treating itself, the decorations, all the things that you would consider uh, great about Halloween. To me, candy corn comes up as well. Um, those are things that I think many consumers missed out on last year. And people are really excited about it once again this year. Um, so if, you know, you are in a home in a neighborhood where there's a lot of trick-or-treaters, prepare for an onslaught of costume trick-or-treaters. And just to show the juxtaposition of 2021 versus 2020, Dr. Fauci actually endorsed the return of trick-or-treating, where last year um, him and many others were sort of advising against it. So we are getting really uh, all municipalities kind of getting behind it um, this year. And I think a lot of research has come out since October 2020, that uh, COVID is not as transmissible outside. So if you have kids trick-or-treating outside, um, obviously um, it's less of a concern. So I think that obviously along with the vaccines um, have made people much more comfortable uh, with the notion of trick-or-treating. Uh, comparing data from last year, actually people are less likely to spend time on their homes. Uh, if you've been a listener of our COVID, uh, I mean, of our State of Consumer series, uh, you've known that I've talked about many, many times how consumers are reinvesting in their homes. They were reinvesting in home theater and Pelotons and, all, you know, in home office situations because consumers have been bound to their homes for a large part of the last 18 months. But now as consumers are finally able to leave their homes, uh, they're actually spending less to decorate their homes. They're spending more on candy, more on costumes, maybe more on uh, beer, wine, spirits, for the parents that is, uh, to entertain, but they're actually spending less to decorate their homes. So um, I think with consumers being home overwhelmingly last year, that sort of was a channel for them to uh, kind of point their creativity as an outlet for their creativity. And this year, uh, while it's still important, not as important as last year. So now, right now you have decorations on sale um, three weeks before Halloween. You know, you're, you're seeing retailers finding that they're having um, a lot of inventory. That's certainly not the case with a lot of categories right now in retail. But as it relates to um, Halloween decorations, you know, the demand is not what many businesses thought it would be. But in other areas of what we'll call the Halloween economy, there is a tremendous amount of demand. Um, People are less likely also to spend time in their homes, not only on their homes, but in their homes. Uh, last year, over 60% of people planned to watch a Halloween-themed movie. Uh, but this year, it's only 40%. So people are ready to get out. Um, and I think you're going to continue to see that, um, hopefully continue heading into 2022. And we'll continue to talk about the evolving consumer as we head into the holiday shopping season and what that means for e-commerce um, and obviously heading into um, you know, next year. 43% uh, of people plan to look up creative ways to celebrate Halloween this year. So people are looking for new ways to get out there um, and, and do different things because, again, they've been so pent up. Um, lacking that excitement, lacking that serendipity. And because of that, there's a lot of research of, of different ways to celebrate, um, different ways to experience Halloween with their friends and family members. Um, in 2021, for the first time ever, Instagram surpassed YouTube as the place to seek inspiration for creative ways to celebrate Halloween. Um, a lot of that's obviously driven by the millennial. Every year, millennials get older and older, obviously. I was at a conference um, 
couple of weeks ago, actually in Hawaii, which is a great place to get invited to give a talk. Um, but I was talking about millennials and how, um, you know, the youngest millennials now um, are not in college anymore. And the oldest millennials are, are in their well into their 40s. And so, you know, millennials are now the CFOs of the household. They are the ones making the purchasing decisions. And millennials grew up on Instagram and they're continuing to use Instagram for inspiration for where they shop and where they dine and where they travel and obviously how they celebrate Halloween. Um, so Instagram is the place. YouTube obviously uh, continues to be very important. Um, I see a question about TikTok. TikTok is growing. I think kids are um, younger kids obviously dominate TikTok. We did a great uh, webinar with our board member and uh, TikTok executive uh, Sophia Hernandez uh, a couple months ago when she was talking about how TikTok continues to grow its demographic base um, beyond just uh, that Gen Z uh, cohort to Gen Y. And I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, TikTok continue um, to sprout up. I think one thing about TikTok is that most people go into the kind of ambient feed of TikTok to consume uh, content, but it's less used as kind of a directed search vehicle where more and more consumers um, are definitely using Instagram to search for hashtags and things of that nature. Um, but thanks, Jess, for that, for that uh, question. Um, Men are more likely to use Instagram for costume inspiration than women, 80 to 60%, which is kind of an interesting data point uh, that we extracted uh, from our study. One in every two people were host or attend a Halloween party. Uh, last year, not many Halloween parties at all. This year, many Halloween parties. And for um, our friends and again, the beer, wine, and liquor space, I'm sure, and as well as the snacks, can um, you know, snack food space, I'm sure this is a huge boon to their business, as well as uh, platforms like pizza. Um, you know, th these are all businesses that may have struggled during Halloween as less consumers wanted to entertain and throw parties. And now all of a sudden, uh, consumers are really jumping back into it. One in every two people hosting a party. That's a pretty big number to me. So um, great to see. Uh, consumer spending on Halloween items, despite the fact that consumers are spending less, maybe um, on home decorations, is expected to reach an all-time high of $10 billion, up from only $8 billion in 2020. So that's a massive jump, 25% year over year. Um, tech companies might grow 20, 30, 40, 50% um, a year. But normally, when you have uh, you know, traditions that have dated back decades um, you know, you usually don't see growth like that on a year over year basis where, you know, 25% more Doritos or bottles of Coca-Cola are sold uh, year over year in any given time. So that's a huge um, jump for the CPG industry. And I know many in the consumer packaged goods space have been hit by rising costs and supply chain issues, but this is obviously a positive that can hopefully counterbalance uh, some of that uh, because there's just more growth that's coming out. Um, this year than these companies certainly have seen in their lifetimes. Uh, a third of adults are spending on planning, uh, planning to spend more money on a costume this year. Um, and that makes sense because more people are going out. Uh, more people are going to be seen in their costumes. Uh, some uh, offices are, are reopening and they're having Halloween uh, parties. We had in 2019 an amazing Halloween party at the Suzy offices. And we will certainly be having uh, a big one next year as we have our office uh, for 2022. Uh, but, you know, that's obviously a place for consumers to really uh, have a creative outlet for, um, you know, expressing themselves. And the fact that a third of, of consumers are planning on spending more money on a costume this year just goes to show that they're taking it more seriously, uh, which is, which again is great to see. Costumes people have in mind, Wonder Woman, Superhero, Zombies, A Witch, A Vampire, Squid Game. I always like to see you know, how um, aspects of pop culture um, are going to head in. Um, I haven't figured out my alpha yet. I, gotta, I, I have to kind of get on that, um, but maybe I should step it up this year and, and, and be something cool. I probably should have worn a costume on this webinar today, um, but next time. I promise I'll do it. But, you know, these are just an idea, some of the costumes that uh, people have in mind. Um, flow from progressive, Patty said. That's a great one. Neo from the Matrix. Keep them coming. Uh, men are also two times more likely to spend on a costume uh, than women, which is, which is interesting. Uh, something that came out of our survey in terms of uh, how much money people are going to be spending um, on Halloween this year. Um, and brands are really, and publishers are, are, are obviously getting personal and finding ways, again, um, to integrate. Um, who is this guy, Dr. I can't remember. Oh, Dr. Evil from uh, Austin Powers. So funny story from Esquire, no hair, no problem. You can be Dr. Evil. Um, I actually have a couple friends uh, that have the bald look and maybe I'll suggest to them they should be Dr. Evil this year because it's 
pretty cool costume, I think. I didn't even thought about that. Um, but obviously, it's a great way for brands to be able to enter uh, kind of the cultural lexicon of um, inserting their, their uh, and Abel hasn't picked the costume either, Abel. So um, I, I'm really interested in seeing what Abel uh, can be because he can pull off costumes that I can't. So let's see, Abel, your creativity for this year. Um, last year, face masks were essential to costumes. So many... Uh, you know, consumers who did go out, they wore face masks. Um, and there were lots of interesting um, kind of integrations. Uh, you see the Silence of the Lambs, uh, you know, mask there. And, you know, many consumers said, okay, I need to wear a face mask for trick-or-treating. So I'm going to integrate that into my costumes. But this year, people are split, like much of America and almost every issue right now. 40% um, don't plan on wearing a COVID mask. And 40% plan on um, adding a mask to their costume. So you're going to see kind of a little bit of everything this year. Um, and 20% of consumers weren't sure yet what they were going to wear. Um, but, you know, we still will see masks trick-or-treating this year, but we're going to see a lot of consumers taking off, off the masks um, as, again, we slowly get out of this crazy COVID phase that we've all lived through. 40% uh, of people feel comfortable attending an indoor party with vaccination requirements. And again, that's really part and parcel with the fact that half of consumers do plan on hosting um, Halloween parties this year. Um, so what about parents of the unvaccinated children? You know, because as of right now, the FDA has not approved really any vaccination for children under 13. So one thing we really want to dig deeper in, and I like this territory because it takes the political aspect out of it, um, you know, always try to toe the line in this divided nation in terms of what I can talk about and um, making sure that we're really focused on the consumer um, as a whole. And this is an area that kind of crosses party lines, so to speak, because no children under 13 are vaccinated. And we want to know, what are they planning? Uh, over 50% of parents plan to make Halloween themed food and drinks uh, this year. Um, Pillsbury uh, is, is coming out with recipes. So you're starting to see many, many more food and beverage uh, companies uh, enter and say, okay, more and more consumers are getting involved. Maybe we should start to come up with custom recipes um, and really try to infuse our brand. Um, over 50% of parents plan to have elaborate Halloween costumes for their kids this year. So not only are parents reinvesting more in their, on their own, they're investing more and more on their kids, uh, which is great to see. Um, and again, you know, companies like Disney and, and, and Marvel are really stepping on the gas and saying this is a great way for us to sell uh, merchandise, get our brands in the popular uh, culture discussion um, and drive incremental revenue from our licensing deals. So you're certainly starting to see uh, many brands look at this as, again, once again, an opportunity for branding. Um, and I think, you know, that makes a lot of sense. One thing everybody can agree on for Halloween is candy. And as I mentioned earlier, we certainly have our fair share of candy experts that are going to be joining us um, in just a short while to talk about what they're seeing um, from their standpoint. But nearly 80% um, bought candy for Halloween this year and plan to buy candy again this year. I'm surprised that number isn't even higher because what's called Halloween without uh, candy? So it's a big part of it. Uh, so to summarize, before we bring on our guests, um, Halloween 2020 was a loss. Um, over 50% of respondents didn't participate in any activities last year, um, but people are diving back in this year. And, um, you know, we really expect a lot of Halloween spending to go up. And, you know, we're also seeing spending go up in certain areas like costumes um, and, and, and entertainment related purchases like food, wine and beverages, um, as well as costumes for their kids. Um, and at the same time, spending less uh, time both on their homes and in their homes. So um, happy Halloween, everybody, and a happy Halloween to our special guests um, who are joining us right now. So I'd like to um, welcome uh, our special guest, Crystal Lindell, uh, the editor of Candy Industry Magazine, uh, Christina Engert, the senior associate manager of Insights and Analytics at Mondelez, and Christopher Doring, who is the senior reporter for Food Dive. Um, it looks like we are still missing Christina. I see... We see you here, Christina, but we don't see your camera. So we can either continue just audio or we can uh, wait for your camera to come on. I think she's coming back on. But Crystal, oh, there you go. Perfect. Are we good? Yeah. Do we have everyone? Can everyone awesome. Hear? Thanks, awesome. Matt. Um, well, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining. Um, I know that this is a busy time of year, especially given the industries that you're all in and uh, would love to just kind of get into a little bit of a discussion about some of the points that we covered um, on today's webinar. Um, so let's, you know, why don't, it, why don't we actually start with a quick introduction? Uh, uh, why don't we start with Christina? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? 
Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Engert. I am a senior associate manager on the insights and analytics team at Mondelez International. I focus primarily on our seasonal business, but I also dabble in our everyday candy business as well. Gotcha. And for those who don't know, Christina, what are some of Mondelez's uh, brands, especially in the sure. candy? Sure. So, you know, I did mention the sour, in the chat that Sour Patch Kids are, you know, a fan favorite for Mondelez. We have Swedish Fish and Oreo as well. So definitely go seek those out. Um, Sour Patch Kids are always a favorite for me personally. Yeah, me too. I love Sour Patch Kids. A big, fa big fan of all those brands. I'm not love just that. that. Um, great. Well, thanks again for joining. Crystal, thanks again for joining once again. Crystal was on our Halloween webinar last year. Hi. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm editor of Candy Industry Magazine, a B2B magazine that covers the entire confectionery industry from ingredients all the way to retail and packaging. And, um, you know, we're excited. It's been Halloween has been a hot topic for the last couple of years, especially so. So it's been interesting to kind of follow everything that's been going on. Absolutely. And Christopher. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Christopher Daring. I'm a senior reporter with Food Dive here in Washington. Um, our coverage map, if you will, is basically everything from the, ma the major CPGs, you know, from Mondelez, for example, to, you know, all the food manufacturers, the beverage companies, the alcohol companies. So we cover, you know, if it's a food or beverage product, we're probably have our hands in it. And it's definitely been a, a busy time for us. Yeah, I'm sure it's a, this is kind of your Super Bowl, right? Uh, with everything happening. So, uh, well, let's start with a question for Crystal because Crystal, you joined uh, me for this conversation last year. Um, and we talked about how, you know, last year was a, a different type of Halloween that we've ever faced. Um, you know, what are some of the things that I guess, surprised you from looking at the Halloween season from last year? And what are your expectations for 2021? Yeah, so it was really interesting to watch because a lot of people were very, very, very concerned about Halloween going into the trick-or-treating season, like the industry as a whole. And candy sales ended up being okay. Um, a lot of people were self-treating, buying for themselves. A lot of people were baking with candy and doing home like scavenger hunts. And they ended up buying a lot of candy. So from that perspective, it ended up being okay. Um, and I mean, people like candy when they're happy, they like it when they're sad. So I think that they'll, you know, they'll be buying a lot of candy again this year too. So it's good that, uh, trick or treating is going to be up for the candy industry anyways. Uh, so it'll be interesting to kind of see how that plays out. Absolutely. Christopher, anything that's, uh, that you saw last year that surprised you and any implications for this year? Well, I mean, I, it's it's interesting to me that kind of, you know, we, we last year was a lot of uncertainty. How are things going to play out? Companies confessed they just really didn't know. And I think this year around, we're seeing a lot more, even if we don't know what the breakdown is going to be, whether, you know, people will be doing trunk or treating or scavenger hunts at home or how many people are actually going to go out and trick or treat. There's a lot more certainty that this pent up demand that we were talking about earlier is really going to come out. And, and I think that's reflective in the fact that, you know, the numbers that you showed earlier in your presentation that, you know, costumes and, and candy. In fact, I, I talked to the National Confectioners Association last week and, and they told me that and, and these numbers kind of struck me as just because they're so big in terms of the increase that I had to double check them that basically they said um, Halloween chocolate and candy sales during the last eight weeks have hit 330 million. So to put that in the context, that's up. 48% from last year. Wow. And 60% from 2019. So that really kind of shows oh, you the, the right. Day. So it's not just it's not just a COVID rebound story. It's kind of a it's kind of a Halloween breakout story. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, I think I think that's the biggest thing. And and, and really, you know, companies have seen that um, not only is it in some respects back to what it was before COVID, but there's a lot of things that have infiltrated how they connect with consumers and how folks celebrate that we're going to see as being a, a permanent part of the celebration going forward from here on out. That's, I mean, it's great to hear. Christina, are you seeing that type of demand for your brands and what are some of the things that y your company is doing to take advantage of this demand? I think that Mondelez, you know, is always super excited to see that people are looking for candy. I agree with Crystal that last year we saw a lot of self-consumption people you know, really wanting to treat themselves. And there's a specialness that comes with each season that is irreplaceable. So you always see people, tr you know, treating themselves during that time of year because it's a limited edition offering. There's a lot of products that you can only get during that time of year. So Monolith definitely likes to take advantage of that. Right, I'm sure. One question I had is, you know, it's great for the industry that you're having this kind of renaissance, so to speak. Um, 
one challenge I know that a lot of CPG companies are facing right now is just the pandemic driven shift to e-commerce, right? I mean, I know that a lot of convenience stores, obviously they're all coming back to form right now, but many consumers leverage platforms like Instacart and, you know, groceries uh, shopping online is, is at a level that, you know, it wasn't even close to pre pandemic. Is that impacting the industry at all in terms of consumers not waiting in line at much at, at the convenience stores and as a result, not grabbing an extra candy bar and, and how, how is the industry sort of responding to that? I know it's a bigger question on Halloween, but it's sort of a pressing question that's been on my mind. Yeah, so I think that in general, that the e-commerce boom will continue to grow, especially with yep. COVID, and, and that's not going to go away anytime soon. But I do think that there is a need and desire for in-person shopping that's still very much present. So, you know, while we're definitely focusing efforts on making sure that we can supply e-commerce, there's definitely opportunities still in store that are really important, especially as consumers go to stores for their everyday shopping and are reminded of, you know, the things that they haven't purchased yet, you know, driving down the aisle and saying, oh, hey, there's Halloween items out. I should go right. grab a bag for myself. So I think, you know, it's a balance, but I don't think it will completely shift to totally e-com. Yeah, I agree. Crystal, Christopher, any thoughts on e-commerce and its impact on the industry? Yeah, uh, I'll just go really quick. Sure, um, great. The, I was concerned about this, and I've asked a lot of companies about this, because not going in store means you're not grabbing that candy bar at the checkout, much less getting right. that impulse seasonal candy. They they quoted me numbers, like, and then very high majority of consumers go in to get produce or meat. So they're still going into the store when yeah. they do like a store pickup, for sure. And so they're still seeing that candy and making yeah, foot traffic. Places. All you need is the foot traffic. The basket size at a grocery store doesn't matter as long as they're in the, in the right. store, right? They still have to check out. Yeah. And um, I will say, though, for C stores, like gum and mint sales have had a really hard time, like really took a hit during the pandemic because people weren't really going to work. They weren't going to school and doing their morning stops or whatever. They weren't right. seeing people. Um, and they're coming back, but they're last I've seen, they were still not back to where they were before the pandemic. Right. Um, so that has been like, you know, that has taken a huge hit. And the sea stores are where you're seeing that. Issue. I wonder if, if you ran an index of commercial real estate, you know, square footage used or unused, and you, you, you kind of ran that next to a similar chart that showed the sales of gum and mints, I would bet that it's very similarly correlated. That mm -hmm. the more and more consumers that start to go back into the office, uh, you know, then it becomes part of their routine. I bet there's a close correlation. And we're certainly seeing in New York City, it's slowly creeping back uh, where people offices are opening. I think everyone thought that this fall, everybody would be back in an office. We thought we'd be back in an office at Susie. It was not to be. But, you know, we're very confident about, you know, early 2022. And I think that's going to start to reverse a lot of those kind of lagging trends we're still seeing post-COVID. Yeah, I mean, I do also think there are, is going to be a lot of like the permanent changes that we've kind of talked about. A lot of people are going to be permanently working from home now. Yeah, no, that will happen. Yeah. So Price Warehouse just announced yesterday, you know, all 10,000 employees are going to be working remotely. So it probably won't come completely back mm -hmm. for sure. Christopher, uh, what are your thoughts on, on the e-commerce trends that are impacting the candy industry? Yeah, I was going to I mean, I was going to kind of take that in a slightly different direction in terms sure. of um, you know, social media and, and the, the, you know, obviously we're, we're aware of the, the value and the importance of companies going on social media and all these platforms that we talked about earlier. But w one thing that I think really emerged last year and, and, you know, I think it's kind of continued this year is that companies are really interacting with consumers on social media, particularly when it comes to planning for, you know, Halloween, uh, you know, like what's your, what's the most popular candy in a particular state or, you know, getting insight that is being incorporated into, you know, products uh, and like, you no know, Mars is doing some, some Skittles that have like a sour flavor embedded in the, in the, in the candy that's mixed in with the regular ones that, you know, they, they've, uh, you know, increased the, the, that in, in their, their product mix just from talking with consumers online. So, you know, not only is social media connecting businesses closer with consumers, but it's, providing a really a valuable platform for them to build the relationship and, and ultimately get product ideas that they can, you know, build out throughout their, their company and their, their product mix. Right. How long, Christina, if, if you were to create a green Oreo for St. Patrick's Day, I'm just curious, like how long you probably, your company has probably done that before. Uh, how long does something like that take to make and get into market? Is it yeah. years? How, like, tell me about that process. The seasonals is, is a unique 
situation and that you definitely have to have a large amount of planning involved just because of the way that seasons is segmented. You know, I joke that it's Halloween festive, which is the winter holidays, Valentine's and Easter. It comes so quickly and it comes almost like a school year. You you go right through it and then it's like, oh, we can breathe. Like, wow. (laughs) <laughs> and so the next thing comes along, right? So you definitely have to have an ample amount of timing to launch things like that. It definitely takes a significant amount of time. Gotcha. And and what drives some of those decisions in terms of understanding what types of promotional activities or custom products you're going to roll out? Like what's the process uh, of figuring out what's going to work? Well, I think, you know, from a high level perspective, it's what works for the brand, right? Right. So making sure that it's in line with the everyday demand spaces and what the brand is doing ultimately on their everyday business, but also making sure that it's unique and special. I spoke about that earlier. I think that that's something that's super unique to seasonals is people look for that specialness, that tradition and nostalgia feeling. So anywhere where you can bring that out is definitely a bonus with consumers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I, agree with Christopher in terms of, I mean, social media obviously has changed the game. It's not news, but it continues to just grow in its power in terms of transforming businesses and how businesses sort of need to go to market. Um, In terms of the candy industry, um, just more broadly, uh, Crystal, what are some of the broader trends you're seeing um, in terms of the types of candies that consumers are are pursuing? Like, are there certain sectors of the candy industry that uh, is gaining steam versus losing steam? Yeah, I mean, you're seeing a lot of like brand extensions are doing really well. And I think some of that is still like the desire for the comfort of knowing what you're going to get. Is there an example that comes to mind? um, Reese's adding potato chips and pretzels to their products and just like extending it. Um, The Nerds gummy clusters um, are doing really well. And that was just taking Nerds rope and cutting it up, basically. So um, you're seeing like just variations on that. And there was data showing that new products uh, launches dropped significantly last year for the candy industry anyways. So um, I'm kind of watching to see if we're going to see like that pent up launching or if it's just kind of going to slowly come back or how they're going to work that. Um, I know that there's like always like a hope that people will eat healthier, but that was my next question. Yeah. When it comes to candy, um, it's really difficult to find that balance, I guess, you know, there's a lot of innovation in that sector, but you know, like I said, it's Reese's with potato chips that are doing really well in the market. I mean, like we won't be seeing Reese's with broccoli anytime soon. No. <laughs> right. <We're>, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and Hershey did re- like relaunch their sugar-free line and their organic products and they just bought Lily's, which is sugar-free chocolate. Um, so like I said, there's, you know, there is some market for that, but I, I still don't see it as like the main part of the candy sector. Right. Like, Christopher, do you agree? I mean, one question, but you took the words out of my mouth, Crystal. I mean, I, I was, there's such a push right now towards organic food and, and healthier eating. And, you know, I, I don't think anyone would say candy should be part of an everyday diet, but it is a way that consumers treat themselves and celebrate, et cetera. Are you seeing any trends in that area, Christopher, that are notable in the food industry overall that may apply to the candy sector? Yeah. I mean, just to kind of piggyback on what Crystal said, she did a good job outlining some of the work that that companies are doing, Hershey specifically, I and mean, they've, they've targeted as a, as a a one major platform for them for growth going forward is targeting these this so-called better for you, you know, whether it's a plant-based option or whether it's uh, you know, low sugar or no sugar, or, you, you know, I, I think ultimately those are going to be a portion of, of sales for these companies. And, and I think it's an area given the, the trend and the shift toward eating better. Um, they have to be in these spaces, but I think ultimately for, for Halloween and, and, you know, Valentine's Day and, and these other holidays where a lot of candy is consumed. I mean, I I think that it's going to continue to be your Reese's with with chips or Reese's pieces or or the, you know the or Oreos, the, right? Or Oreo, you know, chocolate covered Oreos. I mean, yeah, those kinds of things that people have wanted to indulge. Right? But you know, like I said, I think companies they have to be in this better for you space, even at for right a, sake of art. I think there's certain categories where that makes more sense than others. Yeah. Candy right. probably not being one of them. So uh, one thing I did notice this year is that the retailers were sort of putting things out earlier um, for Halloween um, than they have in the past. Is that something that I guess, Christina, you you guys in terms of your merchandising? And if so, what was what was the driver of that? So I think that, you know, this is something we're seeing year over year. We saw this last year with Halloween, festive, Valentine's Day, Easter. I mean, people are always wanting to get their hands on it earlier for that element of it being limited edition. So it's really not that big of a surprise that the same as this year. People are, as soon as they can get it, they want it. So I'm not entirely surprised that it's, you know, we're seeing that happen earlier and earlier. Got it. Got it. 
Okay, cool. Are there, before we go um, pull and able for some uh, Q&A from the audience, are there any other broad trends that you're seeing in the industry, uh, whether Halloween related or not? And I'm really looking at Crystal and Christopher cover the industry that our audience would want to know in terms of maybe we should have our first early 2022 predictions. What are some of the big trends that you're starting to see bubble up in the industry? So let's start with you, Crystal. So something I thought was interesting is that 1-800-Flowers is doing really, really well because yeah, people are too. sending gifts. Um, I personally sent a lot of candy gifts over the last year, actually. Um, and I think there's still a lot of room for growth in that space because obviously 1-800-Flowers is kind of the you know, the leader, I would say in that sector, Absolutely. but there's a lot of space for the other candy companies, I think to kind of, and they are getting into it, but it's, you know, kind of bubbling, I would say. Right. So I, I think that'll continue this year as well. I think there is still a lot of uncertainty about what the winter holidays are going to look like. I know what we all want them to look like, but everyone's kind of uh, trepidatious and, you know, yeah. anxious about what's going to happen. So I actually, you know, to, to Christina's point earlier, we're seeing a lot of data that, you know, last year was sort of the perfect storm in a good way for e-commerce companies and Amazon and Shopify. They had quarters that we've never seen before. Amazon did over a hundred billion in revenue in the fourth quarter. And the reason why is consumers didn't really have a choice. And you, you were looking at a consumer last year with record high savings. Um, they didn't spend any money on travel. Right. And the stimulus was, was, had already hit consumers. The second stimulus didn't yet, but they, they they were so flush with cash and they spent all their money on Amazon on gifts. And and this year, the growth and at least last quarter for both Shopify and Amazon, which are the bellwethers of e-commerce, the growth had slowed. And you know, I think in the fourth quarter, I think you are going to see, to Christina's point, more consumers in the stores. And I think you're already starting to see it. And now is Amazon going away anytime soon? Of course not. E-commerce is here to stay. But I do see a rebalancing happening. Yeah, I just wanted to add really quickly that um, the biggest issue that we're covering right now is supply chain problems and yeah. logistics and having stuff in store for consumers to buy. So that, as far as I know, is going to get a little bit worse before it gets better. Yeah. And so the holiday season is going to be impacted by that. Like I'm sure that any companies listening know that already, but it is a huge issue all the way to the candy companies. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to watch that play out. Yeah, I mean, the supply chain issues are real across every category, whether it's it's chips um, or chips, right? <laughs> whether it's, uh, you know, Intel Pentium chips or it's potato chips is impacting, um, you know, across the board. So I, I definitely think. Are you guys seeing supply chain issues, Christine, on your business? I think every category, you know, in yeah. and out of CPG, I don't know, you know, in what world anyone's not facing supply right. issues. I feel like that's, right. you know, everywhere you turn furniture, you know, cars, everything that you, everywhere you that, look. That's you know, why we sell software. <laughs> it's, it's hard right now. Right. So right. I think everyone's facing those issues. I think that's why you're seeing people shop earlier. I think that that's going to continue to be a trend is if retailers have it, they're going to put it out earlier because people want to get it, have their hands on it sooner. And I think that's going to ring true, especially for the holiday season with, you know, shipping delays and all of that, people are going to really want to make sure that they get those products early. Yeah, absolutely. Christopher, what are your thoughts on just broader trends as we head um, into next year? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say just kind of following up what the two previous speakers have said. I mean, the three big issues for us right now that we seem to be following a lot are, um, you, you know, uh, uh, inflation is an issue, so the supply chain and workers and striking it seems to be yeah. a, something that's kind of just the labor force in general. Right. I mean, it's it's clear, at least as of now, from what we've been able to see, given the the, the, the recent number of strikes that we've seen at major companies that, you know, the the. the shift is kind of tilted in favor of workers and, and they have a little more power and, and more room for, for negotiating. Which could be current, a good thing in the end, right? In the it current could, environment. It could be rebalancing. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, so those, those are the big, those are the big issues that, you know, along with the, the things we've talked about in terms of eating healthier and, and e-commerce, I mean, those obviously have been and will continue to be there. But right now, I mean, those, those other things that I touched on are, are, are really big factors that are impacting the, the food and beverage uh, space right now. Yeah, I recently read an article of the average wage for an employee in the hospitality space has jumped from $20 an hour to $33 an hour during, you know, during the pandemic. And it just goes to show to your point, Christopher, how the balance has shifted and how, you know, th that these hospitality workers are demanding more and the restaurants and the hotels and uh, they need to 
up what they pay uh, people to get them to come to work. And otherwise, they're not going to have a business. So it's happening. It's real. Supply chain issues are real. Inflation's real. I think interest rates are going to be driven up by the Fed. And we're going to have an inflationary period, much like we had in the 70s. I think that's where we're headed, for better or for worse. And it's, a, it's an economic cycle that we're going through, uh, obviously largely driven by the stimulus coming out of the pandemic. Um, yeah, it, it, it'll be interesting to see, like, you know, everyone's been talking a lot, sort of a little bit off topic, but everyone's been talking about the, you know, the cash that's been being pumped into the economy through stimulus and action by the Fed. And it'll be interesting to see what, what happens when that cuts back or interest rates go up, how that ultimately impacts consumer spending. And are they are they willing to, you know, stomach the, the price increases that they're seeing on grocery store shelves? Yep. Yep. And the answer could be no. Right. Uh, so it's just that that that's the tenuous place that our economy is in right now. It's never been in a place where you have consumers with all time record savings, stock market, record highs, rising prices. You know, it's just we don't really know. It's, it's it seems like, you know, we're definitely in for a pullback at some point in the market. And just the question is when um, and, and, and how Americans are going to deal with it. Uh, Christina, do you have anything to add in terms of trends heading into next year or things you guys are looking at at Mondo? You know, I think Crystal touched on this a little bit earlier, but there's just such a level of uncertainty to still. You know, we have vaccines, which are great. You know, Fauci endorsing Halloween is fantastic. We love to see that trick-or-treating is back in action. I know that was something that was deeply missed by consumers who couldn't participate last year, but there's still a lot of unknown and uncertainty. So yeah. I think, you know, there's a lot of consumers making decisions on the fly and very last minute leading up to the season. And I think Halloween and the holidays is going to be really similar. So cons companies and CPG companies especially are going to have to really keep a pulse on consumers to make sure that they're delivering, you know, what consumers need to navigate this tough time. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one thing I've spoken about throughout the state of the consumer series is that consumers trust brands and they trust brands for information that goes well and beyond the products or services that they sell. And, you know, I think it's incumbent on brands to help consumers sort through this uncertainty and give them tips. So if I were selling candy, I would give consumers tips on how to be safe during Halloween this year and just be that trusted ally because that builds brand trust that will manifest at, you know, in the in store shelves. Um, and we've seen that over and over before. So, um, but thank you for that. It's a, it's a great point. I'd love to bring in uh, my colleague, Abel Flint. Abel, how are you? You're on mute. Uh, there you are. You're on mute. How are you um, all doing? Abel's been there with me side by side since the beginning of the pandemic in this uh, in this uh, state of the consumer series, and uh, he's since got himself a Peloton, so he's sort of the poster child for a COVID <laughs> consumer here. Um, but Abel, uh, Abel, let's go into some questions. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the first questions that uh, I wanted to ask is, um, what what candies are you guys seeing them to be the most popular? And actually, I'm going to ask this to Crystal. I know you recently wrote an article in collaboration uh, with CandyStore.com that went through basically, I think, 14 years of sales data to reveal the answers on a state by state basis. So I'd love to hear a little bit from your insights from that article. What was interesting? What did you learn? Um, all of that and kind of what seems to be coming to the top putting me on the spot here a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> I write so many articles, so it's hard to remember sometimes. But um, I think as uh, Matt was actually just speaking to brands that consumers know are, you know, continue to be really important to uh, consumers. And they are still seeking out like what you would consider kind of the traditional favorites. Um, actually, like, in our pre-call, Christina had mentioned that people were being pickier about what they're buying for Halloween because they were going to eat it themselves. So I thought that was a really interesting point. And I think that's why you're seeing like some of the, um, you know, people are buying the chocolates and the brands that they know and they, they know that they like for their trick-or-treating. And I think that you're going to continue to see that. I think the article had, you know, all of your common favorites, like Kit Kat, Reese's, Snickers as your top Halloween candy in each state. Definitely. And, and I, I'll just recap a little bit from your article because I thought it was interesting. But the ones that came to the top were Reese's, Sour Patch Kids. So uh, Christina, you're in great company there. And Starburst. We love to see that. Yeah, we love to see that. But they were tied for the most popular uh, in the states with six states that said that that was kind of their favorite one there. So that was based off of um, sales data from the last 14 years. So very interesting um, there. Um, one question, this is kind of a little bit of an alteration on the one that Matt asked you, but what trends from both 2020 and 2021 are you the most kind of interested and excited to see hopefully carry into 2022? So uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask this one to Christopher. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, you know, we talked a little bit about e-commerce earlier, but I'd be curious to see how, you know, how that continues. One thing we've seen during the pandemic is an increase in D2C. 
Um, you know, I know Mondelez does it, for example, with like customizing Oreos. And I think they might do it with their Sour Patch Kids, too, in terms of sending that D2C. You know, Hershey has a big D2C business. And, you know, that's been an area that we've seen, like I said, grow a, a lot. Uh, you know, Uber paid like a billion dollars or something for Drizzly in terms yeah. of you know, alcohol. Right. So, um, you know, companies are making that a bigger part of their business. Is it is it huge? Is it going to you know move the revenue needle at this point? Probably not, but it's clearly something that's on their radar and something that is becoming a, a bigger part of their business going forward. So that's something that I'd be you know, curious to see, like how that continues to play out is is the growth that we've seen in you know, D2C going to continue? Is the pace going to continue? Maybe it's not going to be as accelerated as it has been during the pandemic, but how big of a, a part of the business is it going to be for the Mondelezas of the world going forward? Yeah. And maybe Christina, do you have any thoughts on that of, you know, where you see e-commerce kind of fitting into this larger puzzle here? Yeah. I mean, again, I think Matt, I touched on it when he had asked, I think e-com will continue to grow, but I think that there are certain offerings that are in store that are irreplaceable, right? So, you know, I saw someone in the chat said the Sour Patch Create Your Own Mix is something that they recommend. And I also would recommend not biasly, but also kind of biasly, um, great option for gifts and whatnot. But there are certain products that really condone for certain occasions within the season and really target trick-or-treating or candy dish. And, and those types of offerings, I think that will still be, you know, really dominant in retailers. Definitely. Crystal, do you have any thoughts on trends from 2020, 2021 that'll, you know, you're hoping will carry into the future? Yeah. I mean, I think this is relevant because it's the industry. Um, what Christopher was talking about, you know, with the strikes and the worker power and seeing how that plays out. I've covered the supply chain. You know, I've been covering candy for almost 11 years and we've always covered the ingredient side of sustainability and how those workers and farmers are treated. And it's been kind of exciting to watch workers basically on the other end of the supply chain, you know, gaining a little bit more leverage and, you know, getting the compensation that they probably deserve. Um, and so seeing that play out and how companies respond to that, I'm very interested in kind of watching that, honestly. Definitely. Um, okay, next question here. Um, and I, I know we touched this on this a little bit, but this person is curious as to, um, you know, are there any insights from Halloween that you think will carry into the rest of uh, the winter holiday season? So we have Thanksgiving, we have Christmas coming up. Um, are there any thoughts there? Maybe I'll, I'll throw this over to Christopher first. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we touched on it a few times now, but, you know, getting things out earlier. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, the, the, the mix of products that are on shelves. I know last year, you know, some companies were hesitant to to do like big, huge, the, like the really large multi-packs just because of the uncertainty of trigger treating. So it'd be interesting to see like how the product mix shakes out going forward. Um, and, and really just preparing for any of the options that could, could happen in terms of how, how consumers celebrate. I mean, you know, how COVID-19 looks, you know, two months from now around the holidays and Christmas, you know, remains to be seen. So companies obviously have to, you know, prepare for a multitude of options to see how things play out in a few weeks because it's, it's very, you know, it's very fluid and, and volatile at this point. Yep. Definitely. Um, anyone else have any more thoughts on that question? Yeah, I think that, you know, oh, sorry, Crystal, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, so I think that, you know, one of the things that is super interesting that, you know, we've talked about a couple of times, but not in great depth is self-consumption and this idea of people treating themselves at the seasons. And, yeah. you know, again, I'm going to sound like a broken record here with the idea of there's this level of specialness around the seasons. It's irreplaceable. But I think that specifically last year, we saw a lot of people treat themselves and, you know, in, revel in that little bit of joy they could bring to their day. And so I think that that's something that we'll see for Halloween this year. And we'll see that carry into the festive season with the unique product offerings that are specific to that season. I think that the, um, I agree with all of that. I think that the vaccines for kids is going to be a huge factor in how the holidays look. It looks like that's going to be available for kids. And I think a lot of people are kind of waiting to see how that plays out. I know a lot of people that I know with kids are watching that. Um, and so I think that's going to be a huge factor for how, comfortable people are having parties and celebrating throughout the rest of the winter. Yeah. And it's going to impact so many, you know, sectors of the economy moving forward, travel, hospitality, et cetera. Definitely. 
Um, here, here's another question. You know, the data we saw that um, you know parents and also adults in general are celebrating Halloween more than ever before. Um, so, kind of curious, Christina, from your perspective and the work that you guys do, how are you starting to think about you know adults and Halloween and the way that you're you're thinking about reaching them? Yeah, so I think that we had talked about this earlier, but we're definitely seeing adults get involved in seasons outside of Halloween as well, right? We're seeing it across the board. So with Easter this past season, we saw adult Easter egg hunts be a trend. People love to get into it. This year, we're seeing people dress up a lot. I think that those things will continue. When Mondelez personally looks at it, not so much as segmented adults versus children, but more so the specific occasions that target certain consumers, right? So there's certain occasions within each season that cater more towards kids and vice versa for adults. So I think that that's kind of primarily how we like to look at it. Definitely. Um, Crystal, I know you also had recently written another article um, talking about a company that was creating an algorithm based on how much candy you should purchase. So that seemed like a very interesting wow. way that they were kind of targeting adults there. I'd love for you to talk about maybe some other ways that brands have been approaching that on your end. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you're seeing a lot of CBD, obviously. So that's been a huge portion of candy and that's obviously targeting adults. So that's been a huge factor. Um, and then your I, millennials are definitely in a nostalgia phase. Um, I, my fiance collects transformers, like they're looking for that, like eighties, nineties, um, consumption. And I think a lot of brands are playing into that and you are seeing that kind of bubble up and people realizing that millennials are so old that they want nostalgia now. Um, and so they're, you know, I buy Sour Patch Kids all the time personally, because it, you know, it reminds me of being a kid. So there's kind of that mix between targeting the adults and then just kind of playing into like the kid inside of them, as they say. Definitely. And Christopher, have you seen any other brands do any interesting work to kind of target adults specifically around uh, Halloween? Yeah, I mean, just like what I mentioned earlier in terms of like going online, especially, um, you know, some some companies are doing like, you know, trunk or treating where they can get the kids and the parents involved is another way to, you know, maybe have a little bit of social distance, but still be outside and, and another way to celebrate. So I think that those are the trends like, like that I mentioned earlier, like trunk or treating, like how how popular are they going to continue to be going forward? Are they, are they really going to, is the momentum that they've gained going to continue or is this just a, a COVID-19 kind of thing? Definitely. Um, well, that's that's the, all the question I had for you, but maybe one final fun question for everyone, but what is your favorite candy that you're looking forward to eating this Halloween? So um, Crystal, I'm going to, you know, if you want to list yours and we'll just kind of do a quick round robin here. Um, I love the Snickers peanut butter that came out, I think a couple years ago now. So that's my favorite there. And then I have honestly nerds gummy clusters are like one of my favorites right now. So I, I would say those two are my top ones right now, but I buy a ton of sour patch and Oreos too. So <laughs> all good. No worries. Uh, Matt, what about you? Candy corn all the way. Candy corn all the way. Cool. Christopher. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I wouldn't do it like necessarily holiday specific, but I've been big on the the, Reese, the, the Reese's peanut butter cups with Reese's pieces in them. Um, those are those are a winner. Nice. Christina, what about you? I think anybody here would be shocked if I said anything but Sour Patch Kids. But no, I, I think the Sour Patch Kids zombies are great. Um, and I also love, you know, the Halloween Oreos are fantastic, too. I don't know. Something about that orange cream really does it. <laughs> yeah. That's very uh, well, I'm personally very excited to try the Reese's potato chip big cups, uh, which you guys talked about a little bit, uh, just did a little bit of quick search and it looks amazing. But um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining. It was great to kind of hear your commentary and um, yeah, I'll hand it back to Matt. Yeah. Thank you, Abel, for joining and to our guests, Crystal, Christopher and Christina. Uh, I pulled that off, said that without stuttering. Um, thank you all for joining. I hope everyone has an amazing Halloween um, and we'll have to check back soon to make sure all of our predictions uh, came true. Uh, and I hope everyone listening and watching has an amazing and safe and happy Halloween as well. So on behalf of myself, Abel, and the whole team at Suzy, thank you so much for joining our latest edition of the State of the Consumer webinar. Uh, until next time, we'll see everyone soon. Take care, everyone.